or didn't. All right, we're going to have to pick on victims. Okay, so we still need a, a note taker, mostly make sure you've got cap, the point in these caps. We also need somebody to watch the chat just in case questions come up in chat um, uh, from people who aren't able to join the mic queue for some reason. Also, speaking of the mic queue, uh, this is a hybrid meeting. Therefore, the mic queue is what's up there on the screen. If you are standing in front of the mic and your name's not up there, you don't actually exist, despite the fact that someone who looks an awful lot like you is standing in the mic line. So make sure you join the meeting uh, because that's where the mic queues run. I mean, it's also worth saying that unless you join the meeting, you haven't signed the blue sheet. So you should join the meeting anyway, even if you have no intention of saying anything. So please join the app, use the QR code, do the blue sheets. Please volunteer somebody to be a note taker or else we'll have an even less time than we currently have, which we are planning to use to the full. Thank you for your assistance. We will, we will try and make them good. So don't worry about the details. We will help, but very much appreciated. So, note taker. Okay. Please record your name in the notes as a note taker. Okay. So, this is TSVWG. As far as I know, the only working group with WG in the acronym. Uh, and we're here to look at the transport area topics. Uh, I'm Gory Fairhurst. I'm one of the working group chairs. This is? I'm David Black and I'm Martin Zeman. Okay. So welcome, Martin. <laughs> uh, got one. We'll, um, yep, Let, let's go through the note well. Um, note well is the standard IETF note well. If you haven't read it on day one, then you should. Uh, this covers the rules for IPR disclosure, among other things. Next slide. Uh, we do need help in TSBWG. We will be pursuing people to help them help with note taking. And we have a note taker for this session. Thank you very much. If, you, if you're intending to produce a document in TSBWG, then please add the acronym TSBWG to your draft. And if you'd like that to proceed, then please offer to review drafts. We need reviewers for working group drafts. Okay, I need a volunteer to watch the chat and uh, bring to the room's attention anything in chat from somebody who's unable to join the mic line for some reason. So looking for a volunteer who's gonna be in the chat anyhow. Anybody? Okay, Richard, can you pay attention to the chat for us? <laughs> okay. 
reasonable it would be. We'll just carry on if it says. No. Okay, uh, quick reminder, uh, please join the meeting uh, of the Blue Sheets. Also, the mic line is run entirely in Meet Echo. You have to join the mic line in Meet Echo. Standing in front of the mic does not put you in the mic line. We run the mic line uh, out of Meet Echo. It's shown on uh, the smaller screen in the cent center of the room. All right. Um, as Gory's noted, uh, document quality relies on reviews. If you'd like documents you care reviewed, please from the efforts to review other documents. Some upcoming documents that could use some careful review are multipath uh, DCCP and the UDP options drafts. All right, time for a review of our greatest hits. No RFC is published since IETF 114, but there are three drafts at the R all three LS L4S drafts are at the RFC editor. They are being actively worked on. They will appear in the very near future. I think we're closing in on uh, what's needed to, uh, to get them published. No drafts at IESG after IETF last call. We have two drafts with ring chairs and authors after last call. Uh, this is yours truly uh, as, as the responsible or irresponsible working group chair. Uh, the EC encapsulation for lower, la lower layer protocols and ECM for tunnels that use shim headers. Uh, we're working through the revised reframing interaction text for that first draft, EC encapsulation for lower layer protocols. With luck, that will, that will close fairly soon and the arts publication credits will be coming. One draft just completed a second working group last call assigning a new recommended DSCP that will be discussed in this meeting. We have a draft in working group last call uh, the NQB PHB. Uh, Greg is going to discuss uh, where, where we are on that one. Um, here are the remaining six drafts. The first five drafts are on the agenda. The sixth one, user ports for experiments, is a fairly small, mostly processed draft. Uh, the draft itself is complete. It's going to be working group last called fairly shortly after this meeting, and uh, we'll deal with them there. If you've been paying very close attention to what we do, you'll notice SCTP NAT is missing from a list above. Uh, we decided the right thing to do was remove it from our, our plan of work because we could not get uh, convergence and agreement on what that, what that draft ought to do. Okay, bunch of related drafts. These are all on the meeting agenda. We have uh, three uh, SCTP drafts, a couple of updates, uh, and a proposal for zero checksum. We have a general uh, internet congestion control guidance draft. Uh, Martin Duke has found a case that we appear to have missed in uh, ECN interaction with tunnels. So there's an individual draft on that. And careful resumption of congestion control. Uh, are you going to talk about that? Or is Yath going to talk about that, Gory? I think Nicholas will try and join us remotely. If not, I'll cover it. OK, sounds good. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay, uh, some related IDs that are not on the agenda, please uh, post a list and talk to the authors if they're interested. Uh, Jason Livingood has a Comcast uh, uh, draft on uh, low latency deployment design. Uh, HPCC++, well, this is sort of on the agenda, sort of not. There's, a, there's one slide coming up. If uh, we get through the agenda quickly, there'll be time down at the end to go into it in much more detail, but we'll have to see. We're trying to run what would normally be a three hour meeting in two hours, and so uh, things are tight. And John uh, has a draft on media head extension for wireless networks, which has been uh, discussed some on the list. And if you're on that list of people, then please be ready to come to the mic when we show your one slide. You have two minutes to present your topic and encourage people to read those drafts, uh, just two minutes in total. And that will happen after slide 17. You're on slide 10, so we're getting there. Okay, <laughs> milestone reviews. We have two regret milestones. It says still about to be achieved, because I thought these were almost done in Philadelphia. I still think they're almost done. We're closer now. Uh, we're well into the second, we're well into the last 10% that takes the other 90% of the time. Um, uh, additional uh, 2022 uh, working group uh, milestones. Uh, we're going to move uh, the UDP options drafts to March uh, 2023 as the new date for them. Um, NQB, well, we're not too far off. It's in working group last call, so we'll leave the milestone in September. Uh, moving forward, we have uh, considerations for assigning new recommended uh, DSCP coming uh, which has been working with last called. Uh, and then if we go into next year, 
Um, use reports for experiment needs a new milestone that looks like January, and then the March uh, details SCTP and July milestones for the DCCP extensions and LFRS operational guidance uh, remain intact. Uh, Magnus, you were in and out of the mic queue. I hope we covered what, whatever it was you were concerned about. <laughs> okay. Uh, agenda. So we start with these slides, including milestones view, which you've just seen. Uh, chairs update. So I've, we've reviewed the ECN encapsulation draft status. We've reviewed the uh, status of first drafts at the RFC editor. Expect to actually be RFCs very soon. It's been a long, strange trip, but we got there. Uh, and the status active work group drafts. We then have a couple of work group drafts on, uh, uh, on uh, DIF serve and, a, uh, and AQM. Um, DIF, DSCP assignment considerations, which it has gone through work group last call. We have some comments to resolve. The LFRS operational guidance, which Greg White's gonna talk about a little bit. Uh, that one's gonna stick around for a while. Moving on, transport drafts. Uh, two sessions on multipath DCCP. There's been some interop testing, uh, and I hear the results have been, have, have been pretty good. Uh, and then Marcus will talk about the base multipath DCC, DCCP draft. John Matson has taken a look at SCP authentication and found, let's see, I think we, we could politely call it some opportunities for improvement. Uh, Michael Tookson is going to talk about what to do about those opportunities. Magnus has our latest details of SCTP draft. And then we have the two uh, UDP options drafts. Uh, I think, Gory, you're, you're going to try to impersonate Joe Touch. Good luck. <laughs> uh, and then the DL, uh, the DPLPMTUD. No, don't, don't, don't actually pronounce that. Uh, 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 support and UDP options. Uh, Gory, is that you or is that Tom Jones? Um, they're both going to be dealt with the same way. All right. OK, uh, individual drafts. Um, SCTP UDP uh, update, um, proposed SCTP zero checksum. Um, Nicholas Kuhn is going to talk about uh, careful, resu careful resumption of congestion control. Gory is going to talk about a general draft on guidelines for congestion control. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Martin Duke has found a case that we, a case of ECN tunnel interaction that appears not to be addressed and has an individual draft to address it. Then down at the end of the meeting, at the end of item five is normally two hours agenda time. If we get through this more quickly, we'll have time down at the end to do uh, HPCC++. Michael has uh, at least one other SCTP draft. John has a metadata draft uh, on metadata for media packets. And finally, Ingemar has uh, 5G radio scheduling and L4S, no draft. He's also gonna talk about that in ICCRG. So it's not essential that we get to it, but it's certainly useful to have a heads up here. Okay, we need to get through some chairs topics, administrative time. Uh, liaison communications, so I'll start. The WBA liaison came a while ago. Uh, it's been dealt with um, and nothing has been heard from WBA since we sent the reply back. In essence, what had happened is a, an individual draft had come here saying, hey, let's go to find PHBs and DSCPs for every five QI we can think of. Uh, to which our response was, uh, that's a lot of DSCPs. Not sure we ought to be using that many. And oh, by the way, 3GPP really does not like what you're doing. Uh, a liaison came from WBA and said, hey, would you please do this? When the response went back was, uh, that can do the whole lot of DSCPs, how about something fewer? And would you please get aligned with 3GPP and get back to us? Nothing has been heard from w WBA since. I think we can retire this, uh, this liaison. So we have a liaison with 3GPP relating to SCTP and DTLS. And this will come up in the liaison discussion uh, tomorrow where we do the coordination. And it may be updated if we need to after this meeting. We will see how all this goes. And GSMA liaison has your name against it as well on multipath DCCP. Yeah, GSMA are aware of the multipath DCCP work. And um, this touches with uh, 3GPP and GSMA work on... Uh, on the multipath DCCP work, really? <laughs> and keep going. Next one's yours too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Gonna make him earn that orange shirt. This is um, IEPG presentation on DSCP measurement is where Anna presented her data. If you didn't see it, you missed it, but it's still in the archive, so you can go and look at it or speak to Anna at this meeting. Um, yeah, we have an IANA registry for PHB IDs. Would you believe it? 
Yeah, well, it's really interesting. Um, IANA was going around checking whether they had uh, active uh, uh, designated experts for each registry and ran across this one. Yours truly is one of the designated experts. Brian Carpenter is the other. We looked at the registry. It's over a decade old. It's still empty. That's a real strong suggestion that whatever it was to find to use the registry isn't particularly useful. Um, so the path forward is I'm going to write a draft that obsoletes the stuff that uses the registry, which is IANA registered uh, per hop behavior IANA registered per hop behavior identification codes for per hop behaviors that aren't standards track and don't have and therefore don't have a default recommended DSCP. The only thing we're going to do is obsolete those things that were never used because nobody ever registered one. Um, get uh, update our 340, get rid of that, leave the existing format, which is essentially an encapsulated DSCP, um, and uh, close the registry. So no effect in use of DSCPs for signaling, no effect in PHP IDs and bit of DSCP. Nobody's used this thing. We're going to get rid of it. Martin. Um, apropos of nothing, uh, the um, secret ISG back channel says the Zulip is back up. So if we can monitor the Zulip, the chat, is back up. So if we could please monitor the chat channel. Thank you. And there will be a PHB ID registry internet draft appearing. Is that right? At some point soon. Don't hold your breath because somewhere between the change in XML format for RFCs, my XML based tool chain collapsed. So I'm going to have to rebuild and mark down tool chain. That comes first. Fortunately, it's a small draft. It's a good test case. Okay. At which point we will look more closely at that registry and decide what to do. Yeah. Okay. And next slide. Welcome, Martin. Welcome, Martin. Martin, would you like to say something on no, behalf no, of Martin? Talking, <laughs> well, I was going to say, this is Martin. I mean, uh, we said the name Martin several times. He's our new working group chair. He's um, acclimatizing to being up here in front of everybody. And um, it's really good to have him here. Yes. Thank you. I will be continuing as a working group chair for the foreseeable future. And David Black. I will be stepping down as working group chair after a uh, long uh, and uh, uh, interest, interesting experience up here. I'm going to continue to shepherd drafts. Not quite sure the exact timing of this, but it will happen some, sometime in the next few months. Mr. Duke, sir. Yeah, I would just take a moment. I would like to take a moment to recognize David. Um, he has been the TSVW chair since before I started coming to IETF meetings. I've never known a TSVWG that he was not chairing and, and like obviously being a very present and active leader of um, an expert on just a wide swath of the kind of, uh, well, first of all, TSVWG is a, you know, a, a very robust group with like a wide swath of technology that it covers. And David has done, covered it quite adeptly and been really an expert on, on a whole lot of stuff. Um, and uh, I mean, hopefully you're, you're not going to, you're going to be around <laughs> to, to continue to um, provide your expertise for the group, just maybe from, from the floor where you can, you know, take the gloves off, which should be quite entertaining. And uh, aside from the technical, uh, you know, obviously this is, this group has had um, its share of strife, uh, <laughs> to be quite frank about it. And um, that's always um, a, uh, a demanding thing for a chair to handle, and he has been um, instrumental in, in doing that. So thank you for everything you've done for the transport area and the ITF. And um, I, like I said, we hope we hope we hope to we hope to continue to see you around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I intend to stick around, perhaps more virtually than physically, but uh, I'm not going away anytime soon. And as Martin has reminds me occasionally, I still have some drafts and responsible for Shepard. Plus one I just volunteered to write. Okay. Okay. Let's go. So the next slides will be the individual documents, which are just brought up here for a heads up. This is a new experiment. You get two minutes to pitch up on your draft if you want to. So come up now if you wish to give it a talk. Um, for two minutes on your draft. If not, then we will we will introduce it for you. So, who's first? Jason. Jason. While Jason's coming to the mic, I'll clarify that Wes Eddy will remain as shepherd for the L4S ops work. Uh, Wes has kindly agreed just to continue with this, so uh, very grateful for that. 
Right, over to Jason for his magic two minutes. <laughs> right, no pressure, two minutes, my goodness. Well, this one's pretty simple. Um, so in the process of getting ready for deployment of uh, L4S types of technologies, I've been talking to a number of folks, not just um, folks in you know, sort of business positions, but policymakers, um, you know, researchers, those kind of folks that really influence the technical environment in which ISPs operate day to day. Um, and the key questions that they often ask, which this uh, draft attempts to address, are um, what this means in relation to prioritization, sort of fast lanes and slow lanes in the American regulatory parlance, and capacity or speed, um, because those are very, very common points of confusion. And then, of course, how does this relate to the concept of net neutrality and uh, fair treatment of all applications without regard to the protocol being used or, or something along those lines. And so those are the key two things that it, it speaks to. And then as a result, it suggests uh, sort of four key things. There might be a, a few more bits and bobs in there, but um, really suggests this orientation towards applications marking the traffic rather than the network. And I put that one in particular because as soon as we started talking about this, we had sort of DPI style vendors coming out of the woodwork telling us that because apps won't be uh, marking anytime soon, we should put this magic, you know, inspection thing in the network and it will magically infer what applications, which by the way are encrypted, you know, need what type of, um, you know, queuing. And that's a nightmare and always results in improper treatment and potentially starvation or other negative effects. And we've done that before with uh, TCP resets, uh, oops. So, um, you know, I, I put that in there. Um, application or edge providers being able to use it um, really on a sort of open basis, multiple, you know, sort of edge equipment uh, types should be uh, supported. Okay, you need to wrap up quickly. So that's that. Um, happy to take any changes and uh, there's a GitHub repository. Thank you. Jeff, are you doing HPCC? Uh, hi, everyone. So HPCC, uh, what is it? It's a novel congestion control mechanism leveraging in band telemetry. So each node in the path will populate some data and sender based on the data can either adjust the sending rate or change entropy. Why should you care? If you are building IP trans infrastructure for either storage or machine learning, especially if you combine learning and inference the same network, you'll figure out hard way that ECMP doesn't work due to collisions, or you'll have to keep your network at 30% loading. Uh, you need to build lossless networks because this is how we do machine learning in general. You would need to spend a lot of time and effort to build network. And if you try to build it lossless fashion without better congestion control, the cost just runs out of control. So practically what we are doing here we are gathering all the data as we traverse the network, send it back to the sender, sender adjusts the rate, and allows you to adjust the rate within RTT. So if you would deploy something like that today, you would probably run DCQCN, which works pretty well for long flows and uh, you know, large environments. However, as you try to put it into machine learning like clusters, it stops working. Uh, we spent a year working on different encodings. You know, there is a zoo of uh, in-band telemetry encapsulation, unfortunately, in IPPM. So we got to support all of these encodings and metadata. Most importantly, we got all four data centers, silicon vendors to support it. So you see Cisco, Broadcom, Mellanox, sorry, NVIDIA, and Intel supporting. It's coming in silicon that's going to be shipping starting now. So please do read the drafts. Uh, we expect a lot of people to be interested in this technology. It's much better than what we have today. Most importantly, there are implementations and deployment. Alibaba runs this HPCC okay. you to wrap up large quickly. scale. Yeah. And Alibaba deployed HPCC with TCP just three months ago. So uh, there is a larger deck published and hopefully we'll get time next uh, ITF to present. Yeah. Thank uh, you. John, go ahead. Yeah, the the, uh, the larger deck is um, is in the meeting materials, and we may get to it if we get get to it. At, if we have time in the session, John, go ahead. 
So this is a draft that identifies some media header extensions in terms of metadata that is uh, specific to wireless networks, I think for now, uh, because the media, I mean, the, the motivation is that media applications demand low latency and high bandwidth. And handling this kind of wireless link capacity variation along with network utilization and the demands of media applications is quite challenging in the wireless networks. Along with that, we have HTTP3 or quick based media that's going to be encrypting packets. So multi-streaming needs to be considered. In 3GPP, the XRM working group has, con con I mean, sorry, study has considered some solutions, uh, but we think that the IETF is a good place to look at these options and avoid, uh, I mean, have a common solution to the problems that exist for all kinds of wireless, I mean, Wi-Fi and 3G PP networks. And uh, we've identified a minimum set of things which we think uh, should be secured and sent only between trusted parties. Uh, but uh, at this point, we're thinking of uh, the priority or importance of packets. For example, an iframe should not, even if it's past a budget, it should be sent because otherwise it causes further damage. Uh, a scheduler in the radio network can get use of packet bursts. So that's going to be a useful uh, amount of information and then delay budgets. Uh, and last, the third part is that, you know, how do we transport it? And there are multiple options at this point, possibly, and each have different trade-offs. So there's media over quick with just HTTP3, UDP options, which is more general, but we've got to consider the API, mask and uh, encapsulation, which is more flexible, but then we're going to consider the overhead. And uh, so, you know, that's that's where we are at this point. Um, if you would read the draft and give comments and suggestions, that would be right. very good. Very nice. Almost exactly two minutes. Well done. Yeah. For those three drafts, please look at them. Please discuss on the list. Um, likely at the next meeting, if requested, we will ask people to see if they've read them and what they think of them. Oh, it's me. <laughs> <clears throat> Here we go. I can actually be me. Um, I'm one of the co-authors of the considerations for assigning a new recommended DSCP. This has been through a working group last call, so I'll try and be relatively quick on this. There were changes in 03 and 04. Um, we added various clarifications. Um, we had a request to mention 3086, so we did. Um, we noted um, more explicitly that there are different ways in which packets can be remarked from the original marking that they were sent with. And we just tried to highlight that a little bit more clearly so that um, nobody got confused about um, implying what it meant to see a remark packet. We changed the word um, pathology, which seems to be a, a relatively common measurement term, but has other connotations used outside of the measurement community. So we can changed it to observe remarking behavior, and we made various editorial updates. Uh, this was the version last called. Um, we had some issues in working group last call. We had a number of different topics raised, and we put those in the issue trackers. The first set here are all things that we think required better text. It's amazing how many times you can improve your text. We found yet more places where the text could be better. Maybe as other people reviewed this higher levels as it, hoping that it passes out of this working group, we'll find yet more corrections. But we think all these are solved in our editor's copy and we plan to push this after this meeting. As soon as the meeting closes, we'll push the new version with a, also an introduction to all the behaviors in section six. David, next one. Um, we didn't include one of the requests made in the working group last call yet in our editor's version. Um, it was to discuss an issue that happens when you have a remarking behavior that comes from a TOS precedence bleach um, where basically the first three bits of the DSCP are reset, and Rudiger gave us this example as part of his uh, offering on comments, and we didn't include this text, but we could still do it if people think it's really important. It described example A and example B, example B being something that is kind of like 
diff-surf compliant because it uses six bits to classify a set of rules into another set of six-bit rules. Each individual DSCP is remarked to a new DSCP. If you were to use some bleaching mechanisms, you would simply zero some part of it, as in example A. Now, anyone who knows anything about any way in which coding happens, you'd realize these actually have the same result. So there are multiple ways to represent the same thing. <laughs> And this is part of the whole confusion about what it means to bleach something. I think the real issue that we were trying to convey in the draft was the intent behind the remarking, not the remarking itself. So if that confused you, you can look at the slide puzzle on it and pass, us co pass comments. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question about this and feels really passionate that um, something should arise from this um, then please let us know. Otherwise, we'll go with the text written here, which I think um, also includes David's comment on a similar subject, which is a very long explanation to say, um, please read the draft and this text if you care. David, next slide. Number three was um, somebody helpfully asked us about the ANA PHBID, and um, it was going to be a nice slide, but David already stole my thunder, and we're not going to say anything about this. And the last slide. There you go. I think we're done. Anybody, any questions or any other issues that they'd like to raise? Good. Then I can go and put my mask on again. Okay. Come on. All right. yeah. Greg, operational guidance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and actually, before I get into operational guidance, I will say one thing about the NQB draft. Um, since you mentioned I would talk about it, um, <laughs> I don't have a slot on the agenda for it. So um, it is in working group last call. There already have been a few uh, comments that have come in on the mailing list, but uh, please do review the draft uh, and contribute to that discussion. Uh, I believe it has two more weeks until um, the working group last call ends. So again, please right. review and provide comments. Thank you. All right. Hang on. All right. Just a minute. You need to go get your slides back. Um, there we go. All right. Um, uh, the L4S ops draft. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Um, um, if you've not um, been aware of this document before, it um, talks about deployment of L4S on the internet as it is today, which um, potentially could include some RFC 3168 or classic um, ECN AQM bottlenecks. Um, and uh, if those do exist on the internet and uh, classic traffic shares that bottleneck with L4S traffic, uh, uh, there can be a rate imbalance where L4S traffic gets uh, more throughput than classic does. Um, anyway, the, the draft talks about uh, how to manage that situation, guidance for end hosts and uh, network operators and researchers. Um, as the L4S drafts have gone through the work last call are now in the uh, editor's queue, um, we as a working group agreed to uh, keep this document open as uh, kind of a living document as the experiments and deployment uh, of L4S begins to capture any learnings that, um, that come along with that initial deployment. Um, so, uh, I just posted a new version of uh, the document uh, today, um, and uh, just to keep it alive. And again, if anyone has any contributions for that document, please uh, bring them up on the mailing list, and, uh, and we'll get them added. So, and I'm quite sure you and Jason know each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. All right. Um, the other topic I want to mention, which wasn't explicitly on the agenda, but since I'm up here, I... Uh, asked to mention it a little bit. Um, go on the next slide, some interoperability events that have been going on around L4S. Um, we had our first uh, IETF L4S interop at um, IETF 114 in Philadelphia. That was um, pretty well attended and got a lot of work done around uh, multiple implementations of L4S congestion control and uh, network bottlenecks and uh, congestion, congestion feedback. Um, bugs were found, bugs were fixed, um, different test cases were run. Um, and uh, after uh, Philadelphia, Cable Labs uh, hosted another interop event at our facility near Denver. 
um, uh, again, uh, nicely attended and, uh, and, and got some good um, uh, results from that. And then currently, um, uh, downstairs in the other tower, um, the main uh, building, we are running our second IETF, L4S Interop. Um, the link on the slide there is the presentation that we did at the conclusion of the hackathon yesterday afternoon, but the testing still continues. Um, some of it will, will run probably all week. Uh, we've got uh, two uh, 5G networks that are uh, implementing L4S, uh, as well as uh, Wi-Fi gear and a uh, fixed network emulator, and then um, a number of different endpoint implementations and congestion control implementations that are running across the, those networks. So um, that's going on currently. And uh, after this meeting, um, down in the, the room where the uh, hackathon was taking place, there is a, um, a happy hour. Please stop by. You can see the demos of the, um, the real-time streaming media applications that are running over L4S bottlenecks. Um, some nice, uh, uh, nice graphical demos for that. Um, so please stop by for that. And then upcoming opportunities. Um, Cable Labs is planning on hosting another interop at our facility in uh, January, uh, end of January. Um, the next IETF in Yokohama, um, there is a possibility to host a third IETF um, interop for L4S um, that uh, will depend on uh, interest and availability. And so if you're interested in participating in that, please let me know. And I think that's it. So our, uh, our milestone for this is completion in July 2023. Does that sound reasonable still? I... I wouldn't change it today, um, but Fine. as we get closer to that date, that might be a good question to ask whether yeah. we're far enough along in the deployment to have further guidance to add. But yeah. We can always revise if it's better. Bob. Hi, I just wanted to um, clarify when Greg said it's in where the hackathon was. Um, it's Admiral Suite, which is the lower ground third floor right at the bottom of the East Tower. Thank you. And Bob, we'll forgive you if you're not joining the mic queue this time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Thank you for your talk. Next topic will be the working group transport ah. drafts with MP DCCP. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, Please go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm Minjun, and uh, I'm from Xiaomi, located in Beijing. Here is our brief introduction for the MPDCCP interoperability test with BT. Is next. Uh, here is what we did. We have ported the MPDCCP to Android 13 based on Android T version phones. Uh, with 5.10 kernel warning running, and uh, we verified the uh, availability and the interoperability of MPDCCP both in LAN and uh, WAN environment. Uh, here, here is what we have done. Uh, we read the specification, reported the uh, MPDCCP kernel module and also the UDCP commenters. And also we solved many problems. And finally, we approved, performed the iProf interoperability test. Next. Uh, uh, before the test, we made some privatization. Uh, we actually follow the reference implementation and uh, we prepared uh, uh, one mobile phone with dual WLAN capability, and uh, we modified the uh, kernel uh, with 5.10.1.1 version. And uh, uh, thanks to DT, they provided the uh, server side implementation. Why is the a virtual machine, and another is uh, one remote server located in Germany. Uh, then we set up the 
plan and the one test environment. Uh, all the IP addresses are listed here. Uh, especially, especially for the one environment, we you we are using the UDCCP header convention uh, application to to avoid the problems with middle boxes between uh, China and Germany internet trans transfer. Uh, the next one. Uh, here are the uh, functions uh, verified in the uh, in our uh, interpolity test. Uh, we configure the, the all necessary options. Uh, first one, we we embed the MPTCCP capability capability on every physical interfaces, and also we enable the transfer options. We also configure the routing rules, and we set the translation port. Mm, finally, we we perform the IPERF, IPERF test. Uh, the right side is uh, functions here, and uh, the next page. Uh, in the first step, we verified the first subflow handshake pro process and along with the MP capable and the MP key functions. Uh, you can see from the uh, TCP dump and the Wireshark uh, files here. The next one. The next one is the second subflow handshake and also the MP join and MPH Mac capabilities here. The next. Uh, the next is uh, this is uh, this is for the sequence and the RTT measurement. The next. Uh, uh, this is for the MP close function verified. The next one, please. Uh, this is for the priority, the address add function, and uh, also the confirm function. The next one. This is a, a address remove remove function and the uh, fallback machine uh, functions. The next one. Uh, here I will plan to uh, push the MPDCCP further. Uh, uh, right now we have test the basic function, and the next step we will port the uh, tune prox to Android kernel and uh, deploy the encapsulation framework to allow the multi-pass transport of any IP traffic. Uh, finally, we will test the real-time service such as uh, Skype VIP services. Uh, the next one. Uh, here our conclusion for the MPTCCP interoperability test. Uh, the functions of MPTCCP works well from our opinion, and uh, we actually uh, use different combinations of MPTCCP uh, in 4.14 and 5.10 Linux reference implementation, and uh, the porting on the Android 13. Mm. Also, we uh, we run the test in both LAN and one environment, which proves the uh, completeness and uh, 
maturity of MPDCCP draft 06 and uh, uh, its usage and the function operations are very similar to the MPDCCP protocol. Okay, that, that's all. Any questions? Well, I just want to say thank you very much. This class of running code is always very, very good to see for a new protocol. So thank you very much. Look, look, looks like a solid piece of work. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so on to Marcus, I think. On. There we go. Hi everyone, Marcus from Deutsche Telekom, uh, giving some overview on the multipass DCCP progress. Next slide, please. Yeah, starting with the draft maturity state, how we as authors see it. So as al already outlined in uh, Philadelphia, we freeze feature state with version four. So no further updates from our side uh, were added to the draft. And we mainly focused on uh, getting external reviewers to providing us uh, feedback um, that accumulated in the current version six of the draft. I will get more into detail on the next slide. Remaining minor work we see at the moment. So there's some uh, feedback from uh, Simone Fellin writer um, and also some IANA review. Um, here we still have to dig into and to close all the existing issues in our GitHub repository. Next slide, please. Yeah, you see a number of changes since last IETF uh, where we presented version five. Now we are at six, as I outlined. I will not go in, in all the details here, um, but just to give you an, a brief overview on the, on the number of issues we solved together with the reviewers. Uh, have in mind all the issues we solved were in accordance with the, with the reviewers, so they gave us the okay uh, that we solved the issue in the draft. Uh, we had some editorial um, issues uh, we solved and all the other things I really helped to, um, yeah, all the other uh, issues um, I mentioned here helps to give some clarity uh, to the whole, to the whole draft and, and make it better readable to externals, not just to the authors. Uh, a full change log is available as you see it on the on bottom right. Um, so we maintain this as GitHub, which gives you a nice overview. One too many. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't look complete, this slide. Some check marks are missing, but maybe I can outline it without having all the symbols uh, presented here. Um, so last time in Philadelphia, um, we mentioned that all the functionalities and multipass options we define in the draft in the, in the left table were completed. And uh, this time we focused on completing all the things in the right uh, table. So we can state implementation is completed. Now we fixed uh, the last uh, things and improved them uh, mainly about multipath confirm functionality, which gives uh, reliability to uh, some of the multipath options like the add address, remove address and the prior. Um, we uh, verified the fallback mechanisms um, also together uh, with Xiaomi, as you have seen in the previous uh, presentation. And we implemented the uh, two different uh, closing procedures based on multipath close and multipath fast close. You also find here um, right to the table, uh, the pull requests in which we added those uh, functionalities to the public GitHub repository of our Linux reference implementation. Um, yeah, and with that, we started the interoperability test as uh, Chomi has outlined. Next slide, please. Okay, so ending with a summary here. Um, yeah, 
we did together with Xiaomi some, or not some, we, we did the interoperability test, uh, which confirmed that multipass uh, DCCP, as it is uh, specified so far, works. And um, all the different uh, functionalities we have specified um, work with, between two different entities, uh, a server hosted by Deutsche Telekom in, in, in Germany and a UE, a smartphone implementation running in China. Um, they ported the multipass DCCP to Android 13 um, based on a 5.10 kernel, and they solved multiple issues uh, compared to the Linux reference implementation. They verified that the code um, matched the MP DCCP uh, specification. And yeah, last but not least, as I already said, so we run the successful, successful interoperability tests. Um, there's also, or what uh, supported us in that uh, was also a new Wireshark detector, um, thanks to a PhD student from City University London, who um, made this uh, public available. Um, and we improved this detector also during the hackathon on Saturday. So saying here, a Wireshark detector is available, uh, which is in line with the MPDCCP Trust version 6. Yeah, now coming uh, to the interesting questions or discussions probably, um, you have maybe have also already seen on the mailing list, also thanks to Gori, um, that we approached to working group last call. And there's also a discussion to move um, the MPDCCP draft from experimental track to proposed standard. So in support of that, let me go try to show the slide Mark is meant to show. It's gonna require a little bit of uh, meat echo magic. <laughs> okay. Um, no, so uh, there, there are no further remarks from my side. Um, I think it would be now good to get some, some feedback on this working group last call and proposed standard track question. Hang on a minute. Sounds okay. Right. Does it work? Yeah, probably. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All the check marks are there. I just cannot get that slide up on the screen. Sorry. So I think the first question I've got to the group is not this question, but first of all, uh, could I have a show of hands for people who have read this or a maybe the previous version? So I want to know how many people have been reading this work as it's been developed. And are we going to use a tool to do this, David? Or are we, oh, yeah. You're, you're, you're showing the ticks. Okay, there's, there's, there's a few ticks here. Um, that's what you wanted to show, isn't it? Right, okay, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to try using the tool, and then maybe as a calibration device, I'm going to try using the room and people's real hands and see if, they cal if, they, if the results calibrate. So can I use this tool? Here we go. Uh, And of course, the next question will be, um, do you have input to help us work with our AD to decide upon the appropriate um, position in the RFC series to publish this? So I'm going to ask for people to come to the mic to comment on that. We've seen some comments on the list. And that will be the next question. Do you want to try the test in the real room or does that, is that a sufficient test, David? We have 13 people who've read this. I think 13, I think over a dozen people who've read this, is, read this is excellent. So uh, let's go ahead to the next one. Okay, so the next question is, does anybody want to provide any additional comments on whether they think this document should progress to a working group last call as PS rather than the current status, which is experimental? So does anybody have any comments that might help us make this judgment? For instance, why wouldn't it be a PS? PS here means standard track. Does anyone think it should be EXP? OK, 
Okay, um, this is actually not the working group's call, but it's the AD working with the chairs to decide, but we need input, and Martin's the man who's going to have to yeah, I, ask questions. I, I definitely would like to add the input, um, or rather have some input, and I, I wanted to wait for somebody, but nobody stood up, so I'll, I'll talk some more. Um, uh, so I think Marcus, so okay, so number one, um, I'm always concerned about real world deployment for this beyond like proofs of concept and so on. Uh, I think there's an excellent point that we also have an MP quit thing going on and it makes sense for that to align. And I don't think my co-AD, oh, my co-AD is here. I couldn't see him a second ago. He and I need to get together on this. Um, my original thinking when we started all this multi-path work was that a lot of the scheduling problems were very researchy problems and that what we were doing here was creating lots of platforms for the research community to be able to run those experiments in a way they can't necessarily do with MPTCP very well. Um, I don't know that if in your particular use case, Marcus, you think you have the, the scheduling problem solved or not, but. So you talk about multipath scheduling. Um, yeah. Right here? Okay. So, um... Multipath scheduling, I think it's, it's for all of the protocols which are currently discussed in IETF, uh, MPTCP, MPDCCP, and Multipath Quick. That is very implementation specific, and uh, we just provide the protocol with that. Uh, from our experience, um, we more or less adopted the scheduler already existing for the Multipath TCP implementation. That was quite simple because the Multipath DCCP protocol as such provides the same information to the schedulers as the Multipath TCP does. and I assume uh, that it's um, also similar to multipass quick. So um, yeah, at the end, we had not to solve something. So we just adopted what, what, is, what already exists. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable approach. And, and like, I, I do think this work is certainly ready to progress as a document um, or certainly go to working with last call. It seems like we have solid implementations and whatnot. So like, I, I don't want to cast any shade on that at all. But I am, <clears throat> I think when we put out a document as proposed standard, that uh, it kind of communicates to non-experts that this is kind of safe to use um, in a way that uh, I don't know that the multipath community is, I, I think there are a lot of people who unfortunately are not in this room to speak for themselves in, in the kind of the research community to say, this is still a research problem, like multipath stuff in general. Um, hey, oh, good. There are lots of people now, so I'll, I'll sit down and be quiet. Uh, uh, hang system. on a minute. You're not in the queue. You don't exist. Lars, you're next. <laughs> that was very harsh. He, he does exist. I've seen him <laughs> standing in front of me. Um, Lars Eckert. So I, I haven't followed the multi-path research space a while ago, so I might not be up to date on this, and then somebody please correct me. So I think the, the, the scheduling problem is still sort of hard, um, and I, don't have, I haven't seen any claims that somebody has a general solution. I know we have solutions that work for certain kinds of path combinations, like you know, Wi-Fi and 3G and so on. Um, but it's, you know, it's, an, it's an efficiency problem in the sense that if you have a scheduler that isn't working very well, you don't get the throughput or the latency you, you, you might get with a better one, but it's not a safety concern. It, it might generate a bit more traffic because there might be some retransmissions happening while the scheduler is doing like stupid stuff, but it's not like driving us to congestion collapse, right? So from a safety perspective, I think uh, this should be fine to go as proposed. But we still actually do need some scheduler for more general multipath scenarios, which is the research question. Okay. Thanks, Lars. I think uh, we would have serious concerns if the group said that there were um, congestion control issues or stability issues with this. Um, but I, that was a really useful input. Would you like to come to the mic? Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry to make an advantage. Sorry to make an example of. Oh, I exist. Oh, I yeah, I just have a general question. I've not read this draft, honestly. But I, in, uh, if you remember the mobile IP work, we did quite a bit of work on multiple care of addresses, multiple tunnels and all of that. There, the underlying tunnel is a GRE tunnel, which can, GREs or IP, but GRE is now extended over GRE UDP. So the question is two questions. I think, what are the key technical differences? Is that in the scheduling, the way 
we use both the links that's question number 1 question number 2 as you know in mobile ip we failed you know i think you know 3gpp system we had references but we didn't have any deployments right overall we spent lot of time if you look at the mobile ip community but we didn't find any traction so what's the where is it heading where do, how do you see who is going to deploy this i think the previous reviewer uh, commenter had the same question have the same comment so the the acoustic is quite bad here so i'm not sure if i really got your two two questions uh, but maybe uh, i try to rephrase it though so the first question was about how the encapsulation works yeah i think uh, i'm trying to compare it with the mobile ip system mm -hmm. where where we support multi path essentially you know you can a mobile node can establish two tunnels from two different access technologies right now i have the option to do flow level distribution or a packet level distribution so i i hope i get your question right but first of all it's required that multiple dccp is implemented in both endpoints and then the access and then we take the multiple access uh, which are available to to um, run the multiple pass dccp protocol across it um the relevance of a mobile system or 5g system i don't understand to be honest okay so you may want to look at some of the work that happened in the mobile ip working groups uh, mobility uh, yeah um so we think with the multi pass dccp we support the mobility aspect so we don't see any issue with that but we don't follow this okay maybe i'll take it off let's take it off yeah. because you know, okay yeah. So I just wanted to respond to Lars, but I was sure to get in the queue. <laughs> um, so I, I, I do feel pretty comfortable this is not going to lead to the collapse of the internet um, under any circumstances, but we also don't have a standard track approach to multi-path congestion control to address shared bottlenecks and the like. So I do have some concerns about fairness issues, um, which should not necessarily block everything, but um, there's that. And then... people will generally adopt this to improve their performance because i think intuitively it makes sense uh, you know multiple paths will improve performance and if the if like the fine print is that if you really don't know what you're doing um with the scheduling like you may not get better performance or get much worse performance that strikes me as maybe not something to stamp with proposed standards it applies to all multi paths it's not a specific critique of mpdccp um uh like maybe that's not something to stamp with standards track at this point like use with care use if only if you know what you're doing if you're a networking professional that's to me that's an experimental rsc but i mean you obviously know a lot about rsc states too so like I, i'm we could talk about this and we're going to talk offline tonight anyway so we can go, but uh, i just wanted to respond for the good of the the uh, community Yeah, Lars like that's actually a good point right so so because we actually did never publish couple of congestion control So so this is the old original um you know um what's the guy's name from Cambridge Hm No Frank Kelly did the math and and Mar and and Costin and Mark Handley did the implementation right which is sort of this the couple of congestion control stuff that came with part of the original Damon Damon right sorry Costin came later um the couple of congestion control has sort of this property that is provably uh safe in the sense that it, you don't inject more traffic into the network than a single flow would and that might be actually something that we could pick up um as a baseline congestion controller because it's mathematically proven that it's you know pretty good and and then you could normatively depend on it and if people wanted to do different things then they could but yeah good point right um we would have a proposed standard um without a congestion controller mm -hmm. which we can recommend which feels sort of dissatisfying so i don't want to derail the discussion but i think it's sort of we should probably figure out if this is if we feel comfortable doing that um what are you using for congestion control at the moment uh, sorry what are you using for congestion control at the moment um we use um a pbr implementation are you coupling the bbrs or are they no. independent okay so, so you are injecting two or yeah. multiple but 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 we see no issues with uh, adopting the uh, couple congestion code control which was specified for multi pass tcp for example so that this could happen 
Right, so that, that would be sort of, I think, the way, but that was, was that experimental, informational? I can't remember. It was not standards track. Okay. You're using Q. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what you do in your implementation is obviously separate from what you would recommend in a specification. Um, and if we could point to the coupled in a specification, that would be a solution. At, at least we have a remark in our draft that we mentioned that coupled congestion control is available and, and can be used. But my question is, do we really need the work to adopt to our prototype coupled congestion control? or can we take the evidence from the multipass TCP that it works? So for your code, right, we're not standardizing the code, we're standardizing words. Exactly. And so the, the words would need to explain how you do it. Because, you know, otherwise everybody needs to figure this out by themselves and that's sort of also then dissatisfying. Do you have words about BBR at the moment in the document or? Is, I struggle now a little bit because I, I know that there are RFCs for, for the couple congestion control for Liara, at least, I think. Um, and that we mentioned in, the, in our trial that this can be used. But do you say how to use it? Or you, oh, anyway, maybe, maybe we're going too deep, but Mira is in the yeah. queue. So, um. yeah, so, so thank you for that. I mean, I think this is what we can investigate offline. I just want to bring the big issues out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and ask for community you know, reaction to them if I'm completely crazy about these concerns. Thanks. Yeah, this, is, this discussion is really helpful. Mira is still in line if you wish to say something. And I think the coupled congestion control for multipath transports was published as EXP in 6356. Right, and it's basically just um, explaining how to couple congestion control without kind of like you could apply different congestion controls to it, and I think it only applies Reno. But anyway, um, that's not what my comment was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm usually like we have this discussion very often that the transport area has been very conservative about going for experimental forced, and like I'm actually been arguing many times that we should more often go for a proposed standard. But I'm actually a little bit uneasy about this one because it's a quite big change. Like multi, uh, multipass TCP was experimental at the beginning as well, and then we got a lot of um, implementation experience. And the one advantage we have here is that you can actually borrow from that experience and you've taken over many mechanisms from, directly from multipass um, TCP, but you still had to add a lot of extra stuff to DCCP, anything about protection, reordering and so on. So there's there's a lot of stuff that I think is, is an addition. So this is for me not a small change. And so for such a change, I would like I would like to have like a slightly higher barrier. And it's great that you now have like a second implementation there, but porting a Linux implementation to Android is kind of, I'm not sure if that actually comes as an independent implementation. Like I would, I would be much happier if somebody would actually from the draft, not from your code, but from the draft, be able to produce an independent implementation, for example. Okay, the last point I understood. Uh... Yeah, I'll clarify that last point, Mira, is actually the requirement for progression on the standards track rather than for proposed standard, but it's a way of judging maturity for sure. And I think what we're asking here is what's the maturity of this spec? Are there risks? Um, if you want to think wider, are the same risks in MPTCP? Are the same risks in MPQuick? please talk to either the chairs or the AD, but please do it quickly, rapidly, because we will have to make some sort of determination. Um, I don't think we can say more at this time and we won't, we won't make a decision until we're ready. Uh, however, we can ask about working group last call and I'd just like to ask um, how many people in the room would be happy to review this document if it were submitted to a working group last call? Um, Maybe I, I could try the tool again, if you like. There you go. Would you be happy to review the next version and say no if you don't think this is anywhere near ready? Or say yes if you'd be happy to review it? And then you can just make your own comments. Well, we, we see people review, review, offering to review. We saw 14 people say they'd read this or a recent version. We heard some discussion at the mic. You already have a lot of feedback. We can't give you the answers to your question, but we'll work on them with our AD and then provide feedback to the list. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you.
Okay. And now for the next. Onward. I'm not sure about upward, but at least onward. Okay. Oh, I see TP. We're currently running roughly to agenda time, so we're good. We're going to talk about SCTP auth. Oh, you've got the analysis, yeah? <clears throat> yeah, so this is about some recent issues or opportunities found in SCTP auth. <laughs> uh, recently, this is joint work with Magnus Westerlund and Claudio Portivi. Um, we're not talking about history, and we're not talking about to solve the problems. That would be in other uh, presentations. Uh, so the security requirement, requirement properties for security protocols or systems have increased incredibly since SATP what was uh, was written uh, for the use and for the use cases there. Uh, <clears throat> Modern systems typically require strong confidentiality, strong integrity, strong replay protection, and high availability. At least these are the things that 5G require for the, the use cases it has for DTLS over SCTP. And with strong here is meant that it should be computationally infeasible as hard as breaking AS. Uh, data here refers to, has to do with external user messages, not internal things like SCTP chunks. Availability is a bit harder to define, but given an attacker, it should not be easier than expected to affect the availability, like sending a single packet and tearing down the association. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, so these are the issues we have found uh, as SCTP what uses, um, the keys are not directional. You can uh, reflect uh, ch authenticated chunks, for example, data chunks. Uh, <clears throat> and to do this, and you need to be an on-path attacker with read capabilities. You don't need to have write capabilities. Uh, for the reflected chunks to be uh, Accepted, you need to match TSN, stream identifier, and stream sequence number. Stream identifier is probably quite easy. Uh, if you have very large messages in the worst case, then the stream sequence number wouldn't change at all. And the thing you need to watch, match is TSN. Uh, so after zero to two to the power of 31 chunks, average two to the power of 30. Uh, in the worst case, it's trivial to do this. Um, and what's happened is that you might reflect the whole message, you might reflect part of a me message, con corrupt the user message, or it might be some error leading to a termination of the association. Uh, uh, next. Uh, then as the replay protection um, chunk duplication relies on TSN, and TSN is, uh, only has two to the power of 32 values. Uh, when this wraps, of the, if you have a very long association, then you can do replay of data. What you have to match is the same as in the reflection attack. Uh, still, worst use case is worst case is that you have very large messages. Then the only then you just have to wait, and it's trivial of the two to thirty-two messages. Uh, <clears throat> this is very similar to the other. The reflection is a little bit easier to do uh, than the replay. The break uh, slightly different properties. Um, next. Uh, slide. Uh, three more issues. Should three is a very theoretical issue, as as and all of these are uh, analysis of the specifications, not any implementation. So this is a theoretical uh, issue. The specification allows you to use the same key with different algorithms. Uh, this is typically should not not or must not in modern RFC, but I don't see any practical problems uh, with the current algorithms. Uh, then four is reflection, but of authenticated control chunks instead of data. <clears throat> and this is easier because you don't have to match uh, TSN. Uh, for example, the error message can be trivially reflected back to the sender. 
uh, if you reflect a SAC control chunk, uh, this might or would or might lead to packet loss, missing data, and inconsistent state, probably tearing down the association at some point. Uh, and then heartbeat act might also be uh, an attack on availability if you uh, reflect that. Uh, so these four is different than the other. This is an attack on availability only, uh, not on integrity and so on. Uh, and five is that you can do replay of uh, control chunks. Um, very similar analysis. Um, uh, probably worse with uh, reflected stuff like error. Next slide. Uh, this is what the different RFCs and drafts says about what they offer. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what is clear is that 3D PP, when reading, uh, when specifying this, thought that they basically got DTLS, uh, same property as DTLS over UDP. They definitely thought they got replay protection, for example. <clears throat> uh, in the last version of SCTP over DTLS over SCTP BIS 5, we have made a very thorough uh, list of exact properties that are provided. I think that's a general recommendation. It should be easy to see what is provided and what is not provided, even if you're not an expert in SCTP. Next. Um, uh, yeah, and this is analysis of uh, what is broken. Um, um, SCTP auth definitely does not offer chunk origin authentication, for example, uh, like it, it promises. Uh, then it, all the other, most other things, whether it promises or not, either you can say it doesn't offer them or it offer them in a weak way. Uh, DTL RFC 6083 uh, is uh, better. Uh, DTLS uses directional keys and uh, it uses single MAC for user message. So you don't break integrity and you don't weaken confidentiality. Uh, these issues had a worse effect on DTLS over SCTP BIS in the version 4 because it uses several records per user message. Uh, in 05, uh, <coughs> issue 1 to 4 should be sold. It's but in general, all the attacks on availability is probably remaining. These are also a bit harder to analyze. A lot of the handling is implementation specific and not really mandated by the specifications. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Um, Michael Jackson, can you go back to the, the list of issues right at the beginning? Which which slide were you at first? This, that one. We can start with that. We, we, no, the next one. Yeah. So the first one, the, refle the reflection stuff. That is an issue in SCDP auth. We, we missed putting in uh, directional specific information in the, in the computation. However, um, for DTLS over SCTP, that shouldn't be an issue because the DTLS keys are directional specific. So an attacker should not be able to in to reflect user data and it's being delivered. So that's not an issue, f I think, for DTLS over SCTP. Yeah, in the, it could be an availability oh, issue. I'm asking about inserting data which looks like it's coming from the peer and it's not, and that is not working. It would not be accepted. Exactly. Yeah. Next slide. Which is the replay stuff and the replay stuff SCP authentication does not provide any better replay protection as the base protocol does. That's stated in the document. And DTLS does this by doing renegotiations, at least in the, the old one where DTLS 1.0 was used and you could do renegotiations. That's the whole reason why we did add support for renegotiation. And it is a dance with sequence numbers and, and, and kind of stuff. But we do not have text in there when you do this, because you can do this because sequence numbers are wrapping, you can do this because you're using an ex extension at that point not defined. We, we just didn't specify that. Next slide. The third one is something we just didn't know. So, and yeah, yes, it is there. I don't know if it's usable, but we just didn't know. Um, 
four and five is the same. I don't think you can do anything except availability things. However, an in my view, an attacker which can take a packet and uh, send it in 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 in, a wrong, in the other direction might also be able to just drop packets. And so it's your host then anyway. At least this was at the point of time we did SCTP auth. There was not a huge difference between an attacker who could read packets and who could well, send packets compared to one who can take out packets. But that might have changed. I don't know. But availability might be an issue. Yes, but can be in other ways. And most of the stuff we can fix in a simple way, which I will you'll cover be, in the you'll, next. You'll be up to next. I wanted to get in here more as an individual, make one quick comment. The word replay is being tossed around a little bit cavalierly. In security, replay attacks usually refer to attacks where the attacker can replay the uh, attacking data at the time and place of her choosing. These replay attacks here, they're, they are replay attacks, but they are much more specific because they, the replay can only happen exactly when the, when the sequence number rolls over and comes back around. So it's much more limited than we usually see for a replay attack in security context. It is nonetheless uh, an actual attack. It's a nice piece of analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to briefly say thank you for breaking our stuff. <laughs> one, of the, one, of the, one of the most valuable things that, that we can hear is that our security has got problems, and I look forward to the, to the revisions that will come from this. It's a huge, a huge contribution. Thank you. Okay. And I think now for something completely different, we have... Michael, do we? Why did it this one? Right? Yes. <laughs> so more on SCTP security this time, Michael. Yeah. Um. I, I just forgot that. Yeah. Thank you for the analysis. So it's it's uh, it wasn't up to whatever our our view that we should need to put in some directional stuff because when we did SCTP authentication, we did it in the framework of protecting certain control chunks, which we didn't even foresee that they will see, there will be a lot of them. Okay, so what's the, I, I'm talking about a BIS document and um, I started on working on this BIS document way before, uh, not way before, but before um, I got aware of the security um, issues. So um, Years ago, there was a, a document, SCP auth, based someone from, submitted by someone I don't know, um, basically covering some textual improvements where some of the wording was not clear enough for the author and he should, and he wanted to improve that. So that's definitely something one should, we, should, we, we, uh, we, we would include. Um, the motivation of this was based on a discussion um, I had with the authors of um, the DTLS document. Basically, um, the mandatory to implement algorithm is uh, SHA-1, HMAC uh, using SHA-1, and there is the wish to uh, have other ones deal with this stuff uh, and in particular, so defined are actually two. So the DTLS over SCTP wanted to use uh, the other one and make sure from the API perspective that they can do this. So this is also something um, we would um, uh, add there that you have a way to control this. And I think to cover most of the stuff uh, John has brought up is one is to include a direction specific data in the computation of the of the Mac and basically this can be um, this is port numbers and the verification tag from the from the common header so this is not equal and, and you can just do that and this third theoretical one I think could be solved by um, doing a key derivation um, uh, a directional specific one um, and, and an algorithm specific one. So the status of the document is um, I submitted the 00 version 
as similar as possible to the existing RFC, um, going through formatting it as an internet draft, but using the same XML sources I got from the RFC editor. I updated it to XML v3 because it was written earlier. And I did some wordsmithing and updating the reference, but the old IANA con in considerations are there. No technical content has been changed. Um, because, next slide. Um, is that one? Yeah, because um, uh, the question is whether this sh should be adopted as a working group item. And if yes, then it might be better to, to change to a working group document and then do any substantial changes there so you can easily see them in the, issue in the data tracker there. Of course, when we do this work, any additional input will be incorporated, but you see the scope of the, the changes we wanted to make. Also, Magnus, I think, brought up going away from the HMAC stuff, generalizing to a Mac, allowing more algorithms. That's it from my side. Okay. Questions? Magnus, but actually not a question. I think it's we need to do do something with SSB auth. It's it needs to be improved here. So it's just. I mean, we need to fix the issues brought yeah. up by John. Yeah. And I guess the poll's giving you the answers about working group adoption, and um, people haven't yet read it. So, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and given the motivational speeches going on today, it may be a good thing to read. So we will we will not make any determination about the working group adoption at this moment. Please read this. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Next up. Have... Now for something not completely different. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are different. <laughs> not completely, though. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Magnus Westlund, talk about the details over SCTP. Um, so the latest version is 05. Um, talk a little bit about status. We have three issues here on the list uh, and a little bit dealing with those, what we just talked about. Uh, so, but let's take the next slide. So um, <clears throat> the current status is where we've been working through Martin Thompson's review. We mostly addressed the issues there. Uh, next slide, is it? Yeah. Um, there are a few that's dependent on the issues uh, especially on the detailers versioning, et cetera, which we would wait what to do, resolve before going ahead and do those text changes. Um, but yeah, I think a big, a big relation is to regards to this SCTV auth security issues. So, but uh, let's go forward to that issue then. So uh, detailers over SCTP in this version has this very a higher than uh, dependency on SCTV auth than 683 has because it's what ensures that the detailers record as a part of the user message, protected user message fragments are in the right order. Therefore, any replays, et cetera, is really bad for us because that means that you could actually affect the resulting message, message integrity if you actually get through a data record. That verifies. Um, so a, re a straight replay that actually fits correctly could mean that you actually get corrupted message through. That would be really bad. Um, there are mitigations here, and I think we could uh, go on to that next slide. Um, uh, for the reflection attack, etc. cetera. Uh, and for the reflection attacks, we could, uh, I mean, fix the SSP auth. It, that takes care of this, would fix that. Uh, and I think uh, rekeying is, is as a requirement from details over SDP is a fairly straightforward, making it very clear that you need to retire the any SDP auth keys before you've wrapped. So um, the fact that this is that I'm mean, gonna have implementation impact on SDP auth and the stack, which means that some of our baselines they go into this is affected. But I think it's the other question of going forward here is is if these mitigations are sufficient, implementable to reaching those security goals we see as being sufficient for, for example, 3D PPs and 5D deployments there with very long sessions. Uh, so go to the next slide. Um, 
I really would like to encourage people to care about this, to have some insight and need for this, to actually do a security analysis and determine what, what their stands are. Um, the other aspect we see is that the details of SCTP is complex. There's a lot of corner cases, etc., to avoid the SCTP implementation impact. Uh, we have some ideas how we could actually do details more in SCTP, which would be simpler, enable a less complex details, uh, details implementation requirements would be simpler, etc. And and we are actually proposing here to actually uh, that we would actually go write an individual draft for an alternative to just present as as we will have a delay at this stage until SSTB auth is fixed if we stay on the current path. And, and it might be that that alternative path is, is equally fast or faster to basically as, as fast as to complete and provides better properties. But um, alternative, we want to investigate that a bit. Um, so um, next slide. So if anyone has any comments about the SSTB auth aspects, it's, now is a good time. The next as issue we have is, is about which details stacks we should support. Um, supporting only details 1.3 would make our life easier from a spec perspective. It would also improve, I think, uh, the potential for an uh, interoperability failure if one side supports only details 1.3 and the other only 1.2. Um, so, um, but what was raised in the discussion on the mailing list when I brought this up earlier was that, yeah, the availability of details 1.3 stacks is currently not great. It is much more limited than details 1.2. We know that Wolf SSL is in beta, it's announced. I talked to Summit Mozilla and yeah, the NSS is coming there, but they will not have connection ID. And an important aspect of this is that with the details over SCP that's currently in the draft, we do have requirements on connection IDs, turning off replay, and we need large record sizes and or you can need to support negotiation to smaller maximum record size for details. And these are features we are kind of, you need to have for implementation to work, so. Um, so, Michael, a question, comment? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, is it relevant what open source implement open source DTLS implementations um, provide since there are IPR issues? So, I mean, I, 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 are the IPRs outside of what you need in a DTLS implementation? And no, I think it's uh, so. Uh, I, hmm, I <laughs> let's see uh, how I should answer that question. Uh, I think it brought, talking about open source details implementation here is about uh, if how you get an implementation of details over SCTP in place. And, and that, uh, I mean, details stacks is, is not trivial. There's some lead time if you, would, if you would go order one and want to have it tested and secure, et cetera, it's going to take quite a while. And these extra features, you're probably going to have to order. That's, that's, I think, is the concern here. Uh, but I, my point was, can I use Wolf? So, can I use an open source DTLS implementation to implement DTLS over SCTP since it has some some patent? Uh, part of that is patent protected. So, I'm 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 just not sure. What can I? What? Why? Okay. So, if 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 the IPR claims we have, for example, um, have is not covering DTLS as it is. I mean, if it would be, then it's okay. I'm, I'm yeah. just asking. Can I, yeah, can, yeah. can I suggest that this uh, uh, discussion be taken offline? The usability of open source libraries in non-open source has a long track record, but what you can do depends on the exact licensing condition of the specific library, which is not a real good topic to discuss here. I was just asking because Wolf SSL is given there. So it's. Um, I, I said, I think, I think you've opened up a rat hole. Um, I suggest you find legal counsel to, 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 to work through the license details. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Yes. I mean, my point to bring this up was just saying what's, what looks appears to be the current situation of publicly known implementations. That's the only thing I wanted to state here. Uh, so, and uh, next, next slide. Uh, ah, okay. But 
is there anyone having any more input? I mean, otherwise, what was raised on the list was saying, oh, no, we don't want to go to 1.3. And I guess if, if no one has more input, that might be where we'd be stuck here. Martin? Uh, uh, yeah, Martin Duke, Google, um, no hats. Uh, like the future's bigger than the past. If, if this is a much shorter document and you're not like desperate to ship it tomorrow, as long as we feel reasonably confident that TL the TLS 1.3 is on roadmaps of major implementations, yeah. um, you know, if we can eliminate a lot of stuff, like that's good. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I think it's especially dependent on if we can take this alternative road that might reduce this list of features needed, which makes it even easier. Um, so I think, yeah, I've, it might be just best to delay this question a bit and see where how long it takes to fix the rest of the aspects here. Um, so uh, on this last issue, there's one important aspect has to do with, uh, so Marty brought this up uh, and background here is really that, yeah, you have those things that are detailed as messages between the stacks, between the endpoints, that handshake the errors, any errors or close notify, which is terminated. Um, we have 683 did stream zero in order delivery of these. We changed this to any stream, et cetera. What Martin brought up was saying, well, it might be hard to optimize this to ensure that you send your records to the fast path and only take these messages to your slower path. Um, so uh, next slide. Uh, the one interesting question in this is the identification of these messages. Uh, and this actually I want to hopefully get some feedback on that eventually. It's like, because 1.3 hides what they are. The content type is internal, it's encrypted and, and uh, et cetera. So the stack, when it's processed, it will know if it was, oh, this is a handshake message, um, not so. But if you're gonna actually be able to sort this out before you send them to the details implementation, we need to have an identifier on them being details message or being details records with protected user messages. And, and that ends up in a question is, we, are we okay to expose this? It leads to, I think, some potentials for trying to target these measures specifically in a, in a low volume or something to, to affect the session, affecting availability, I would say here, and not really other things. So, and, but one way of identifying was to do stick a PPID on this particular message that's headed for the, the end stack, not the records. But um, if someone has any input on this, it would be great. Okay. So, um, yeah, come talk to me or send an email or whatever. Um, the timeline of this will be de delayed. I was hoping that we would actually have a chance of meeting the March deadline. That doesn't look feasible now. We need to fix SDB or fix or not use another version, uh, alternative detail solution. Um, but I hope that we will be able to move forward in a reasonable pace here and we do try to update the draft uh, in not too extent, but yeah. Uh, and I think we might have to notify 3 dpp about these uh, delays and the security issues should be the SDB worth here. So they are aware of it because, so. So therefore I would like to send an Ellis from this group to, to so. yeah. Um, Any questions? Thank you. Clearly, we need to gather some momentum around the SCTP and the authentication problems, text, and new techniques. So we'll look forward to inputs on that. We have next this. OK. Uh, I'm going to cut the announcements about Joe Touch's UDP options and the related DPLP MTUD for UDP options. Uh, we're awaiting a revised ID from Joe Touch, which we intend to working group last call. So um, if you're interested in an update, that's the situation. Revised ID expected shortly after this ITF. So we'll move straight on to Michael Tuxen on SCDP UDP. This is the individual draft. Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> 
Yeah, this is an individual draft. Um, next slide. And um, it basically um, deals with HTTP over UDP encapsulation. So this is one of the possible ways to transfer HTTP over UDP through legacy NATs. And um, there is an RFC for it. It's 6951. It does not describe how to handle um, init packets containing an init chunk because you have no verification tag. You have no way to verify that this packet is really coming from your peers. So it, said it has an impact on whether you should update your port numbers or not. And um, this issue is covered in the draft given there. And uh, I think when Magnus was already, was still transport ID, uh, we asked how to progress. And the argument was, well, maybe you just do a BIS document instead of having two small documents describing one thing. And I asked um, Martin and got the same response. So this is basically, um, uh, the the the, uh, the first uh, document trying to join, join these both. Next slide. Um, and I did what I did with the other documents: submit zero zero as the original RFC, change to XML v three, and do some updates of the documents which were outdated. Um, there are two implementations. Oh, there are two open source implementations in kernel stacks right now, which is FreeBSD and Linux, and both are covered on the RFC and the draft. So both are um, uh, doing the right thing, um, but it's not documented in a single document right now. And the idea is to um, get this cleaned up, which is, I think, the next slide, right? Yeah. And of course, we would incorporate any additional feedback coming up through any kind of discussion. Could I ask the first question? Yeah, the question is, is the working group adopting? So, so what the point is, if the working group is not adopting it, it doesn't make sense to progress the document. So it's an offer. When do you think this has to be done by? Whenever there's time and resources. Sure. So, so there, I mean, the implementations are there. The, the draft describing the issue is there. I can keep it updated. It's just that um, if, if you're just looking, for, based on the experience from the Linux people, they, they find the RFC, but they don't find the draft describing what they also have to do. So that's it. OK, any questions from anyone else? I would say less pressure than auth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd encourage feedback on this one. Um, it's something we've talked about a number of times. Please read it. Please progress it. Please come and present again. Mm -hmm. And let's ask those questions when we've got more people reading this, because okay. I, I think it's something that should be of interest to this group, given the previous work. Okay. Uh, Michael. Not so fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this so, is an individual draft by Michael <laughs> Tuxon. <laughs> okay, so this is a document about um, zero checksum. Next slide. Um, SDB uses as a checksum CSC 32C, which is a 32-bit checksum, which needs some CPU cycles to be computed. And there are use cases, which is WebRTC in particular, where you run SCTP over DTLS. So you have a much better protection of your packet from your lower layer than you get from your CRC. So um, and, and there are people using WebRTC on CPU constraint devices, um, which just don't compute the CRC on the receive side because they can do this without breaking interoperability, um, but they can do it, can't do it on the sender side. So uh, the idea is to um, add to the handshake a parameter stating, I'm willing to accept zero as a checksum. And then you can do this in the handshake. You can do it backwards compatible. And then you don't have to compute the checksums anymore when you do the data transfer. There are co-authors from Google trying to, willing to implement this into the, what's the name, Google WebRTC implementation used in Chrome. There is a co-author from Mozilla um, willing to integrate this into 
um, the um, Firefox browser. And um, so there is, there is support from implementers. Uh, next slide. Um, and we have support in Wireshark. We have support in Packetro for doing tests. Um, I'm working on a um, on an implementation, um, and it's a very simple document. But we need this document to get the assignment of this parameter, so it's specification required. Um, that's why it's here, and that is a document I would say um, which is very simple, could be progressed very fast, and um, people would like to deploy this. So, same question is again. Um, and we would integrate, I mean, we would integrate uh, comments and we got comments from Gori, uh, from Mike and from Ayana, basically about, we, we, norm we normally do in the Ayana section, write the specific number. So question to the document author, do you want me to ask who's read it or do you want to give them the time to chew it over and get a better answer? Up to you. All right, I, I, will ask. I guess we get the same answer. Yeah, all right, okay, let's go. Um, here we go. Who's, who has read this document um, coming in now? Who has... I'll come to the mic if you have any question. You do exist. We have a... Poll going on and questions concurrently. Go I have ahead, a question. Uh, hi, Lars Eggert. So for, specif for specification required, you actually don't need an RFC. You need a stable specification that's around, right? But it doesn't need to be done in a working group. Just saying. And a stable specification is a draft which is not changed any time. Or something that the uh, Ayana will accept when they get the request. There should be an expert reviewer, which might be even you. I'm just po pointing it out, right? So the, it, it's specification required is not RFC required. Um, and, and so okay. there is the option. Right, I'm going to ask an additional question. Um, Lars is correct, um, but let's ask this question. Um, who thinks this is a useful piece of work, which is abbreviated WRK, to do in this working group? With an extra U for fun in the question to try and stimulate the response at this moment because people might think this is a useful thing to do here even though um, they haven't read it because it's pretty clear what it's meant to do. And uh, I will keep talking or come to the mic, ask any questions, because we're seeing a response in the chat. And we have Mike and Martin. Uh, very quickly, if you have specification required, it could be published as a, uh, outside the working group, uh, I suppose, as an option. Thank you. Yeah, possible. Hey, Martin Duke, Google. Um, you know, I, I asked the question about SCP working group, a couple of months ago, you told me there was no need. Now we have five drafts up for adoption. <laughs> um, <clears throat> like, so, yeah, I, to be clear, I've read zero of these drafts, uh, but I think the presentations have made a pretty convincing case for all of them, uh, you know, addressed at some point. And uh, I, I guess the real question is working group bandwidth for the, from the chairs. Yeah. Like, how many of these can we swallow at once? Um, and do we need to, like, have some, do we need to set up a very quick working group to clear through this backlog if these things are urgent or not? Um, okay, we, we, we will triage that question because we also see the same community uh, making the responses for each of these drafts and we will ch check the work cycles, et cetera. Yeah, okay. uh, this particular draft is, is simple and we will uh, take I comments it's simple, in this it can room. Be fixed. So Lars, an additional comment? Yeah, sort of. I mean, I got flashbacks to when Magnus and I were transport EDs and we talked about the SDP working group. And the, the reason we didn't at the time was that it, we felt that the, the SDP community was too small and it, it, the, it wouldn't get enough review. And that might as well, might have well changed, but it, it doesn't quite appear that way. And so it's probably the best home is unfortunately still here. So we will look at that part of the problem space. Uh, the answer to my poll is clearly people think this is a useful piece of work to do in this working group. And so I'd encourage you to keep revising and come for an adoption call in the future. Okay. Right. Uh, do we Magnus, still have Magnus? Magnus, did, did you want to say something? 
<coughs> I guess I need to pull my and to get rigorous about the discussion about whence, uh, just ensuring that I, I think this document makes sense in the context. This it just needs to be very clear on on its very limited applicability or is saying the requirement. And I think it's decently clear already, so it's it's not a problem. But uh, yeah, so yeah, because running without checksums, verifying ports, etc., uh, over the internet and having no additional mechanism would be a bad idea from my perspective. Exactly. The IHF has been through this process in a much more torturous way, and I think we can make good recommendations on the applicability for this. And we should keep moving because we have little time left, but we have a couple of talks, so we should... Um, is Nicholas online? Yes, he is. Nicholas, you, your slide deck is ready. Please present. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. So next slide, please. Uh, so this draft is uh, activities we have been presenting in IETF uh, in different working groups, and in particular uh, in a quick working group. Um, the main idea here is on this discussion is, uh, so the, these first slides are how to quickly catch up with the activity about catching up and on the boundaries. Uh, so in the satellite industry, uh, there are some cases where uh, it takes a lot of time for uh, the congestion control to quickly ramp up to the high BDP that is available. So this is an experiment we have been we have done uh, where we have been downloading and made with uh, Quick, and we could have seen that basically uh, on red and on, on the bottom right part of the slide, um, it took a while for Quick to actually converge to what was the bandwidth. Uh, the, the bottleneck data rate. Um, so we have been thinking that um, storing the idea of knowing what was the past characteristics uh, and using it to new connections could be very interesting. Um, the thing is, you should not do that uh, without any care. So we have to be careful about how to do that and, and stop doing it if you find that anything has changed in the network. Um, next slide, please. So we have been proposing different uh, type of uh, documents to cover this issue. Uh, in the last summer, we there has been a adoption call in the Creek working group for two drafts. So basically, the first one is careful resume is how you can store computed congestion control parameters um, to actually modify the congestion control behavior of subsequent connections. Let's say. And the first connection, I understood I was using a satellite link. And on the next uh, connection to the same peer, uh, I just want to use uh, previously computed condition control parameters. Um, we also had another draft, uh, which was a specific implementation of that issue. So we have basically the BDB frame extension for Quick that has been implemented in Pico Quick and tested over real satellite networks. This is how to store and exchange the computed values uh, uh, between peers. So we have been proposing that to Quick Working Group, and um, basically the discussion, the conclusion of, of the different call was that the problem space is more broadly to do with congestion control and not really Quick specific. Um, indeed, uh, we need to must. We, we, this solution must to effectively share the capacity with all the transports, and um, maybe there is a way to do that with all the transports. Uh, so that's why we are here, and to see if uh, there are any discussions here that are related to and relevant for the TSV WG. Um, basically, this: what are the constant control items that we think could be interesting for the group? Um, so if, if we assume that we have had a first connection that has finished and the information has been stored, um, we think a, a question, an open question that we have is um, what whatever information you, you can obtain to change that the path has not changed that much. So we think that, for example, if you lose pa if you lose packets after sending the first IW, uh, there should be some problem with the network, so you should, may not uh, resume to the previous constant control parameters. You can use the minimum RTT values. Um, you can also use the inter-packet inter time. 
um, the interpacking time on other activities, we have measured that this uh, metric was very useful to detect congestion in the network. So we think there is discussion here. Uh, we have discussed uh, some algorithms in the draft uh, that we have been we have posted recently. Um, then, when you know that the path has been checked, how do you carefully jump? Uh, you may not want to use to go directly to what was the previously measured uh, bandwidth. So you may want to be careful in that, uh, some sort of uh, specific slow start algorithm. Um, let's say uh, you just did the jump. Uh, how do you react if you see any congestion um, in the network? And also, when Christian implemented that in uh, PicoQuick, we saw that there are some aspects that are very specific on the constant control that you have been using. If you use Cubic or Reno, it's different. Um, you may have iStart or iStart++ uh, making your constant control going out of the slow start. Uh, so you, you, this is something that we think is very interesting to, to discuss. And these items are currently um, discussed in the in the current version of the draft. Uh, next slide, please. There are some things that are related to transport, but not maybe so relevant for TSVWG. Um, it's basically how do the client ask for this jump? Uh, because in the quick uh, implementation, we have been using the zero RTT and the TLS certificate signaling, or we at least we use a specific frame that is protected by TLS. Um, but the problem is that uh, when you use, um, you, you may you may end up being very specific on both constant control and the TLS versions that you have you are using, basically to know what do you send and when do you send it and how protected this information is. And also another aspect is really the real system performances of that, and that is not covered in the draft for the moment. So in the end. Um, we have been pushing out for this work in Quick Working Group. We've been said that uh, maybe this should be um, addressed with a more wider view. So we were wondering if there is any interest in the TSVWG to, and is there any appetite for this work? And uh, if uh, you would want to, to, to join us to, as we seek to define the appropriate details of such solution. Thank you, Nicholas. Any questions to Nicholas? There's one person in the queue online. Okay, we'll, we'll take Piers. Yeah, Piers, please come to the mic. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, this, has been going, this has been used um, by TCP and um, Linux kernel for some time, like TCP metrics, so whether you've looked at the uh, how that works um, with in comparison to the approaches you've been considering because it caches like uh, CWIND, RTT, and then it obviously um, reuses those for the different congestion control algorithms that are kicking off. Yeah, um, so the, these, thank you. We, we, there, we have been looking at that uh, and also we wanted to have this kind of TCP metrics save for quick and in a way that is uh, interoperable in a way that the client can participate in the decision on whether this metric is used or not. Okay, yeah, so I, I guess it was just useful to look at how that, that's been working to inform how, how you might kind of start do the same thing. It obviously works reasonably well. Yeah, indeed. The, the, there are things like, so they have timeouts and stuff like that in the, in the TCP metrics. Um, so they, they don't last forever. I don't know. I'm not quite sure about the um, algorithms around that. But anyway, okay. That's good. You're yeah. looking at it. Piers, could you send an email to the list, please? Can I? Uh, send an email to the list with what you just said. That would be so helpful. Okay. Yeah, I think I did very briefly. I think it was mentioned on the quick list, and I mentioned it. Yeah. There, but then it kind of went over here. So then, okay, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. And that would be so helpful. And while we're talking about where it might be going, uh, I think it's a cue for Martin to come to the mic for one minute. 
Yeah, uh, I just want to announce to people, uh, many of you probably remember from TSV area 114, a discussion about a congestion control working group possibility um, that chartering work is still going along in the background. And for those of you who might be interested, there will be a side meeting at 5 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, please come by if this is up your alley. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Nicholas, as a chair, and we will encourage discussion of that item on the list. I think uh, we've had feedback for that particular document in various places in the IETF, so I'd encourage you to carry on working on it, and we will try and find a home working with our AD. Obviously, Thursday is an interesting meeting to attend, if you possibly can. And I've taken my mask off to stand here to put yet another flavour on the whole story, um, which is a draft that I produced a little while ago, which may or may not be related to all this story. So next slide, please. Um, okay, this slide kind of captures what I was trying to do. The IETF has said about much about congestion control in the past. Much of it has prevented a meltdown, congestion collapse and starvation of the internet. Does our advice still apply? Hmm, we should perhaps check this. Uh, there's more than 40 references which are informative on this and about 10 which are normative descriptions of congestion control things you need to do. Next. In 2019, um, I decided to write a four page document on the core things that would encourage a CC to play well. What happens if you make a new congestion controller? What would you be needed? And next. It took more than four pages. Uh, next. So um, I wrote a draft. I presented it in Singapore. You might go, what happened? Well, what happened is we failed to meet as a community face to face. And this actually is more, I think, of a design team type activity than it is of a design activity. So I wanted to resurrect it now we are starting to meet face to face. And I would encourage you to come around talk about whether the IETF has made the right recommendations in the BCP series for its congestion control. And maybe we can add another RFC or update one, or maybe we'll just conclude with a bit of guidance that this is actually okay. I don't have an opinion, but I've tried to write a draft. And this is the draft story, and we're now at draft seven. Please go quickly. Next, please. Um, there's the principles of congestion control, and the key thing that I'm motivating is that things have changed. We absolutely must be preventing persistent congestion. That's things like starvation, congestion collapse, and lots of other horrible things which would put us all out of work. But we also have to react to incipient congestion by adjusting the rate of particular flows to nicely play with one another. And I think these exist at different levels of importance. And we've kind of recognized that over the years, but it's not really reflected in the RFC series to the same extent. So I've tried to group the recommendations on these two topics separately. Next slide. Um, yeah, I rewrote, um, I changed a lot. Next slide. Um, there's a table of contents, just to encourage you. It's not actually as long as it looks because some of this is um, mother and apple pie and some of it is the new stuff. Well, the new stuff's just grouping the old stuff. So actually it's an easy read. So please read it. Next slide. And is anyone willing to play with me on trying to get this right? And that's the reason for standing here. Um, I've had one or two offers um, at this meeting of people who've worked in congestion control previously and would be really great people to have on my side to try and get this right. If you're willing to join me, please do. If you've got different opinions to me, even better. I don't mind. I don't mind what the recommendation is. I just mind that we get a new one that is appropriate or we establish that the current ones are quite right. So anyone will help me, please come and speak to me after this meeting. We, we could squeeze a similar, very quick pitch from Martin if you want to do it. Do you want to talk or do you want to just to show the slide? So Martin is talking as an individual, and this is on the ECN story. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, all right. I'm not going to go all the way through this, but um, there's a bunch of ECN drafts out there. Um, uh, I don't think they cover all the cases. Specifically, I did a review of a um, IPsec draft that like mashes a bunch of packets together. Uh, if you mash together different ECN markings, given that CE is now sort of ambiguous, uh, 
there's trouble. Next slide. And so after a lot of thinking and a lot of assumptions, which are probably wrong and ought to be challenged, like I came up with this big truth table, please take a look. Uh, if there's something we want to do, we can do it. If we want to somehow munch documents together, it's getting late in the day, but we could do that too. Um, let me know. Thanks. So uh, David Black speaking as an individual, I took a look at I took a look at this and the existing drafts. This is a standalone piece of work. Uh, Martin, I agree with Martin's take that it's not covered in 6040. It looks like it would be a useful update. And as an individual, I'd support just to, just taking this forward and doing this as an add-on to 6040. Any other comments? Take them to the list. It's been <laughs> super good having all you people here. Um, the meeting's not over. Uh, we're carrying on the IETF meeting for a while, so please continue to talk about transport things. This particular session's finished. Uh, thank you for attending. See you online or in person if you're here. Thank you, everybody. One session per session thing is listed. So I don't know if you didn't realize that when you requested your session. No, we could have no, asked for two. We should have. Well, then we, we should have. We, yeah. we should have asked for two. But because, there's the evidence. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, it's fine. Right. So next time. Uh, ask for two because um, yeah. we, there, there's another hour material we didn't get.